My name is Max Gagliardi, and you're listening to the Talk Energy Podcast. If you're watching this video, take a moment, hit the subscribe button on YouTube, or you can follow me on your favorite podcast app. You could leave a review on Apple Podcasts. That would help the channel a bunch. This episode's guest is Natalie Biggs. Natalie is the Director of Thermal Coal Markets for Wood McKinsey. She's an expert in the coal markets and has been very busy this year watching all the craziness play out across the world's energy markets. And I was excited to have her on because I feel like coal is an undercover topic in the energy space. Seems like many people have just forgotten how important coal is to the global energy mix. This episode, we discuss the current state of the coal markets. We dive into the ongoing energy crisis in Europe and how coal is continuing to play a huge role in energy security for these countries that have lost access to Russian gas. Lastly, we dive into the supply and demand dynamics for thermal coal and talk about how rumors of coal's demise have been greatly exaggerated. Hope you enjoy the show. Natalie, welcome to Talk Energy. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's, it's, exciting, it's exciting to have some more uh, coal content on the podcast. I've had uh, one or two other guests that have kind of talked about it, but it's something that I don't follow as closely and I'm really interested in it. Uh, and so I think that maybe the easiest way to start would just be give some of your background and then talk about uh, your company, what you guys do, and maybe uh, we'll get into kind of your broad outlook on the global uh, coal space right now. All right, great. Sounds good. So my name is Natalie Biggs, and I'm the global head of thermal coal markets for Wood McKenzie. Um, we create uh, research products um, across a variety of different commodities, study power markets. Um, and so my group in particular, we've got uh, products that cover um, individual coal mines across the globe, uh, do valuations, um, and uh, you know, develop specifics on on qualities for the mines, cost production, um, and then we also have our markets products that develop uh, supply, demand, price forecasts um, out to twenty fifty. So that's a, a bit about what we do. I've been doing it for fifteen years um, in the coal markets. I started with a uh, a U.S. based uh, coal consultancy group um, and have just expanded from there. So I've yeah. done a little bit of everything, met thermal coal, uh, global, so I can talk a little bit across different sectors. Well, it seems to, yeah, that's awesome. And I love how you guys probably do these really in-depth supply demand, deep dives. You look at like, you know, specific producing, producing regions as well as specific, specific demand regions and kind of what's going on, um, the level of granularity there to where you're probably super qualified uh, to ask some of the, or to answer some of these questions I'm gonna get into. Uh, but just like, I think the general thought around coal for me personally as somebody who's been more focused on natural gas and oil in my career uh, is that it's kind of this like, you know, declining thing and it's sort of like relevancy is becoming less so uh, in my career. And I think that like, it seems like the death of coal has been like uh, greatly exaggerated or uh, overly exaggerated. It seems like coal is kind of taking the spotlight again. Just give us your thoughts on the global coal situation in the markets right now. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely having a moment um, in terms of, you know, the uh, this year has definitely highlighted the need for coal um, in terms of, of energy reliability. Um, and it's, it's interesting that, that everyone sort of thinks of coal as a, a declining commodity where um, last year was probably um, the, the highest year in terms of coal demand. Um, and we're talking globally. So on a global right. term, um, sure. coal was at its highest in 2021. So it, it hasn't been declining. It's been increasing. Um, in particular regions, it has been declining, like developed economies. But in um, other developing economies, particularly in Asia, um, there's been a tremendous amount of coal growth and um, countries continue to add new coal plants and there's still a pipeline of new coal plants coming on. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we we look for is uh, the point at which on a levelized cost basis. Um, so right now in Asia, coal is the cheapest uh, source of energy on a levelized cost basis, so across the life of the plant. Um, but uh, there's going to be a point at which utility scale solar 
uh, does become cheaper than coal at some point. And at that point, the pipeline of new coal projects, uh, new coal plants will start to uh, dwindle. And, and, and then the, the story for coal starts to reverse, um, you know, probably in the la- latter half of the decade. So it's still growing, de- but, you, you know. in a decade it'll re- uh, reverse? That's sooner than I would have thought. That's interesting. So for like the really basic... A little bit. Yeah, stuff, I mean slightly. Yeah. Sorry, we, we can get into that here more in a second. Sorry, there's a little bit of a delay usually on this. Uh, for like the really basic one-on-one stuff, taking CO2 emissions aside, let's not talk about the environmental aspect of coal, but just like why is coal such a... It's a really powerful form of energy, and there's a lot of really good things that, about it and advantages of it. Uh, before we get into some of this more technical stuff, just speak to that for maybe some guests that uh, really don't know the difference of why you would have coal or not gas or whatever. Right. The 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 trend has been towards natural gas um, for the particularly for these developing economies that are trying to tackle CO two emissions, and that's because coal, in general, is about uh, per kilowatt hour it produces about twice the amount of CO2 uh, than natural gas does. And so that's why, you know, in recent history, natural gas generation has been seen sort of as the tra- uh, the transition fuel um, as they try to break away from fossil fuels and move towards renewable energy. Um, and natural gas has been seen as the transition fuel because it's uh, half the CO2 emissions than, than coal is typically. Well, what I was saying, actually, I maybe misunderstood the question. I guess my point is that some people don't understand why, just like the basic uh, characteristics of what makes coal outside of, I mean, obviously it's dirtier to burn from a CO2 perspective, is which is why a lot of developing places are now using nat gas. And nat gas has been really price competitive the last decade also, but there's been some natural forces there as well. But for these developing uh, economies and countries, just some of the advantages to having coal. I mean, the, the ability to store it, you know, things like that, uh, the cost competitiveness, et cetera. Oh, right. Yeah, I mean, coal is, um, the situation for Europe in particular is a perfect example um, because of the, the pipeline reliability for Russian gas supply. So the only other way to, to export it by um, other methods uh, on the seaborne market you would have to liquefy natural gas, transport it over, and then have the regasification facilities to turn it back into natural gas rather than uh, LNG. So the issue for Europe is that they don't have enough regasification capacity. Um, there's also not as much LNG supply in the market um, to fulfill all of their gas needs. So they were reliant on that piped gas from Russia. Um, whereas coal markets, it's a lot uh, more flexible. You can, it, there's a, a strong infrastructure uh, capability for exporting coal uh, on the seaborne market, um, the ARA or um, European coal port. Um, have a lot of additional capacity to to ship coal in, um, and there's a lot of rail capacity to to bring coal to the market. Um, they can stockpile the coal at the coal plants and keep over 50 days of supply on hand. Um, and so, in that in that sense, um, coal is a little bit more reliable. Europe isn't as um, uh, 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 reliant on any particular country for its exports or its imports, I should say. That's a great place to kind of segue into the next topic, which is really understanding the impact of the Russia and Ukraine war and the sanctions on Russia around energy and how that's impacting uh, Europe's coal markets and the situation uh, for these European countries and and, uh, trying to shore up their energy, energy security as well, which you alluded to earlier. Right. Um, And it's for, For European markets, the situation really comes down to a key point about coal quality differences. So for the plants that take imported Russian coal um, and are reliant on a higher quality coal. So in terms of um, calorific value, it's a uh, 5,800 kcal per kg over that that, um, quality level um, versus a a lower quality coal, um, which would be below that level. So it's a it's a, basically a tale of two different markets. Um, 
that's driving uh, coal prices at the moment. So those plants that take crushing coal um, are reliant on a higher quality coal um, that cannot be easily replaced on the market. Um, it's, it's a matter of boiler design. So these plants uh, can't take the lesser quality coals, uh, mainly because the boiler can't handle the amount of coal because you're going to need more coal in order to make out for the heat content loss. Um, so the, the other issue in the market is that um, the higher quality coal market cannot easily ramp up production or, or scale as quickly as the lower quality market. And it's a, a matter of uh, coal production methods. So higher quality coals are typically the older coals that have been, um, uh, they're, they're further underground, they've had more uh, pressure and, and time to condense the uh, carbon content in the coals and that's why they're higher heat. Um, so the mining methods are more uh, concentrated on underground mining. Um, where it, the the mining methods are are pretty inflexible in terms of uh, increasing capacity, they can't do that easily. They would have to add more equipment or bring on a new mine. Versus the lower quality market, where those are younger coals, they're typically closer to the surface, and you have more surface mining operations where it's just a a big shovel scooping up coal uh, um, on in the ground. So that market, that low quality market, can scale easily where the higher quality market cannot. So the alternative suppliers to Russia um, are limited for Europe. And um, right now, uh, uh, total uh, EU coal imports, Russia represents around 70% of that market. So the EU is going to need to replace 40 million tons of thermal coal, all on that high quality market, which the seaborne market in general, is around 300 million tons. So that's 40 million tons that has to get replaced. And if it's a, um, a, type, a type of coal that is low in sulfur, which will have lower SO2 emissions, um, which Europe has been, um, has SO2 uh, restrictions in the past, um, then, you know, that market's probably around 230, 240 million tons on the seaborne market. Now, wow. we, Germany has um, reduced the sulfur restrictions a bit in order in order to be able to be more flexible about the the kind of coals that it's taking, and that's sort of aimed at the U.S. market because the U.S. market um, produces a lot of high energy coal that's also high in sulfur. So that's the trade off there. Interesting. Uh, it's just so. I mean, the, uh, number one, I really liked that you went through and broke it down like that. Cause for me, I kind of know the general uh, aspect that there are differences in quality, but again, I'm more, you know, comfortable with like crude quality or natural gas composition, things like that. So hearing this is, it, it's helpful for me and I'm sure it's helpful for some of the guests. <clears throat> and I'm also assuming that the higher quality, I think, does it burn more efficiently? It's, is it a better, or is there really a difference to the emissions quality between, you know, the higher, the lower quality? Does it, is it more efficient? Do you need less of it to create more energy? Is that a correct assumption or is that not correct? No, that's correct. It's, it's higher efficiency for um, the plant operations. And it also is more environmentally friendly because if you burn less coal, then you're right. going to produce less emissions. So that's another so factor I'm, for. Yeah. So I'm assuming like, you know, buyers. these developed countries are probably to your, what you're saying about Europe, they really would prefer the higher quality, which is why they're uh, tooled. These power plants are tooled to have that quality of coal. And sounds like Russia was a major supplier of that. And now that's going away or is, you know, thought to be going away if these sanctions continue put them in a situation, you know, what's really crazy is just the amount of ripple effects in the energy markets from this uh, conflict. I mean, I, again, I've been more focused on that gas, but man, it just seems like you, once you dig into like the product side, the now coal listening to this, that's a lot. I mean, it sounds like they've got a material logistical challenge on their hands. Uh, what can they do to replace that if they can, or is it not, I mean, in the near term, medium term to long term, what are their options in Europe? And wh in which country specifically are uh, are the ones that are going to need to do this? 
Yeah. And it's even it's even more extreme than the 40 million tons that they're going to need to replace from Russia, because there's also um, a, over 11 gigawatts of mothballed coal fired capacity that Europe's planning on bringing on by this winter. Um, and so that works out on an annualized basis to around 25 million tons of coal. And then they're also increasing operations from existing um uh, coal plants. So that's maybe another 10. So there's a tremendous amount of coal import potential from uh, Europe uh, that's going to be increasing this winter and into next year. Um, and so Europe, since the start of the war, has been in this scramble to find alternative suppliers. So as the war started, they were um, out consistently negotiating with uh, the U.S., Colombia, Australia, um, trying to find these alternative, uh, trying to do contracts with these alternative suppliers to secure the coal that they need. Where uh, it, it's caused this interesting situation where Europe are typically, um, in turn, when they're when they're doing coal contracts, Europe is more interested in long-term contracts, where the Asian buyers, with the exception of uh, Japan and Taiwan, are uh, do more purchases over spot contracts. So, and Europe will pay, you know, premiums to the current spot market in order to secure those um, long-term deals. So, Europe, when this war hit, they were out negotiating contracts, sometimes paying sometimes a you know, over spot prices, $100, $150 per ton. So they, you know, were buying coal at whatever price would would secure the deal. Whereas Asian buyers with the high prices retreated from the market initially, um, sort of waiting out the high prices, hoping that the prices would fall. And so they retreated from the import market. And that caused a situation um, in about May or June where, uh, stockpile levels in India, in the importing regions of India and China were at critical levels, and um, the government had to intervene in order to get utilities to build back stocks. Um, India's government was encouraging uh, utilities to buy more imported coal in order to um, make up for the, the stockpile loss there. So basically, Europe's appetite for coal is drawing coal imports away from Asian buyers and causing some issues for them in terms of reliability. What are and they just going to go to Russia? Okay, go ahead. Sorry. They are. Uh, they're importing more Russian coal. India in particular has increased uh, Russian coal imports significantly this year. And it's, um, it's an interesting dynamic because where prices are at the moment, um, they're able to export coal um, Russia is able to export coal through the western ports, going all about back, all the way around back to uh, the Pacific market um, and into India. It's a very high ocean freight cost, but where prices are at the moment, it's a, a drop in the bucket <laughs> in terms yeah. of um, yeah. the overall price. It's it's they're getting an excellent deal because Russia is having to discount heavily to make up for that European loss. And um, and they're doing they're doing that ocean freight route because uh, Russian coal is limited in its ability to, to uh, ship more coal to the east because of uh, infrastructure constraints with ports and in rail, so they can't easily pivot all that coal to Asia, um, and so that's why we're seeing these strange ocean freight routes. It's interesting. So supply side has really been. Is it an aggregate, like if I, when I think about like the oil markets, for example, you can look at like aggregate amount of production total, and then you have to kind of start to subdivide it for these sanctions and start to say, okay, uh, it's not all going down, but you can get less of it from certain regions. Is the total aggregate coal production down? Uh, has the trend been down on the supply side or has it been steady? Has it been up? Or is it more these fluctuations are just because now you're getting it bifurcated and certain regions are getting cut off, other regions are getting... You see, does that make question make sense? Like, what's the overall supply yeah. been like? Yeah, it's it's a, that's a, another really good point because um, you know basically the market is in a situation where they need the high quality coal suppliers to supply as much as possible and even grow um, production. But 
that hasn't been the case this year. It's they've a lot of suppliers have been having issues with, um, you know, keeping up with um, the amount of supply that they did last year because there's been uh, flooding issues, uh, particularly as of late in Australia, the Newcastle um, uh, region was at a stoppage because of flooding events in that region um, over the last month. And there's also been flooding issues in Colombia. Um, there's been issues with South Africa being able to uh, ship coal around along the rails because Transnet has been um, having issues with people people stealing copper along the rail lines and that's, yeah. and that's been slowing the, the train shipments. Um, and so it's been a struggle for producers to, to keep up. And, and one of the, um, one of the key suppliers in, in Colombia, um, they've been looking for uh, this one operation that was closed during the pandemic. It was uh, the Prodeco operation. That's around 15 million tons a year, high quality coal there. The market's been, watching that operation to see if it would open later this year. But that production, it, it looks like that mine is unlikely to open this year. There, it's troubled by a number of issues. The political situation in Colombia, where they um, just elected uh, a president who is anti-coal and would like to hmm. um, end coal production by 2034 in the country, um, but will honor existing contracts. Um, and so they were trying to get this Prodeco operation sold by July before the president takes office in August, and they weren't able to get any bids, and it looks like that that operation's uh, at a high risk for reopening. That's interesting. I was wondering about this, uh, the ESG impact on coal production as well as demand, but, uh, you know, what I've seen, at least like, for example, on the natural gas side, you're seeing things like uh, new... For example, pipelines out of the Northeast getting canceled, people, you know, doing this in the name of, I guess, uh, you know, ESG or some of them are activists that are blocking these things. But the point is, is that they're saying we got to reduce uh, the supply, yet the world's not really ready to move on from natural gas. I mean, clearly, and now the U.S., the price is a lot higher. We can't bring more online to the tune of what we need to, and it's more complex than what I just described. But you get my point. Are you seeing this with coal as well, where – people may be prematurely phasing things out in the name of the environment or, you know, because of a leader that wants to make a stand, like you just said, and doesn't want to have any more coal production, but yet the market's like not ready for that to happen yet. uh, And it's reacting. Oh yeah. I mean, uh, coal was the original, you know, OG on, uh, on ESG concerns. Um, So yeah, there was a lot of, of, you know, coal has, has been, um, significantly underfunded for over a decade because of um, issues around access to capital or even insurance. So a lot of these uh, major banks or insurance companies have made ESG commitments that have gradually ratcheted up over the last decade um, where they are moving away from coal and moving away from funding coal or new coal projects. And so that has left the market um, short on access to capital, or it's made capital costs extremely high. So the discount rates for coal can sometimes be 25% or above um, for, for a new coal project. And so that's, or they'll have shorter pay- payback periods where um, they have to pay back uh, on the project three to five years in length. So, um, you know, that's made access to capital extremely costly um, and limited um, your options for for capital. And so the the market's been underfunded and that's been reflected in in where we are today. There just um, isn't a lot of movement to increase production um, for the coal market. So we're in a situation where we're critically short of coal, but the producers aren't rushing out to open new coal mines or invest in projects because they've been burned in the past. The U.S. producers in particular have been through about three bankruptcy cycles and a little over than a, over a decade. And, you know, all of these lessons learned has led to um, a, a bit of caution about rushing out to supply the market when when you think of Europe, if they continue on their goals for coal plant retirements, you're rushing out into a market that 
is disappearing in five years or, or 10 years. So that's a major risk. And that's why producers are kind of sitting on the sidelines for the most part. And then uh, we haven't talked about price, but how has that, uh, what, you know, what are the things driving the price trends? And I'm guessing that this is one of them, but uh, talk a little bit about price, where it's at today, uh, globally, I know there's different benchmarks, but then uh, kind of how that compares to historically. Right. I mean, we are beyond anything that we've seen historically. I mean, I think, at, at, uh, so Newcastle benchmark seaborne uh, coal prices are at $420 per ton. And that is uh, well beyond what we've seen historically. I think at one point it was getting close to $300 per ton, um, I think around 2011, but um, it it has never gotten to this point. I mean, a few years ago, we were, we were you know, in the, the 80s and it was just stagnant for a long period of time. And so now... Um, we're just beyond anything that we've ever seen before. Yeah. And it's really interesting that even though coal prices are so high, margins are so high, we don't have uh, a lot of investment in, in, um, in opening new coal mines or, you know, investments in, in expanding operations, um, you know, particularly when the market is so short. So it's it's even though that they're experiencing very high margins, they're just not willing to um, to invest because this yeah. this we we've we've been burned before where uh, we've seen it before where the we'll be in a market super cycle. Producers will rush out to bring on new coal mines, and then the market gets oversupplied, and then we're in a prolonged period of sometimes negative margins for a lot of operators and. Uh, that we're just not seeing that um, in this market at this time. Yeah. And you're not seeing it as much in some of the other commodity uh, markets as well. It's interesting because you just would think that this would be the logical, you know, it's like the same thing in oil and gas. It's like, they haven't been exploring. You can look back since 2014 and it wasn't all ESG. A lot of it was just like price related and people weren't making money. And so you weren't spending money on uh, exploration projects. And then you add in like, the ESG pressures, the lending pressures, and groups really don't want to take on like long dated projects, right? Like you can do short dated stuff. Like U.S. Shale is a great investment for people because they can do it relatively quickly and they don't have to go invest in some offshore, uh, you know, uh, field that they have to spend tens of millions of dollars on. So how long does it take for these coal, for like a new coal mine to come online and for these things to happen? I'm assuming this is like, long dated and a ton of capital, but I, I really don't know much about it, but that would be, I mean, this seems like the logical outcome from all this, but to your point, people, are they going to rush out and go do new coal mines or tell me about, talk about that it, process. It depends on what uh, location you're in. Um, but because a lot of locations, like if you're looking at the U S or Australia have a very long permitting process and depending on the, the government in place at that time, that could be, extended. So we're looking at years. I mean, if you're, if you're trying to open a new underground mine, there's a lot that has to go into um, preparations to, to get to the, to the coal seams. You have to build a shaft um, down into the, uh, the mountain or the mine and it, it just all of the infrastructure that, that has to take place in order to actually start producing coal. It's a very long process. Um, and that's not, even accounting for the permitting that goes into it ahead of time. So there's, we're talking years to bring on new coal mines and uh, it's very cost, costly, particularly for the underground, which that's the, the segment that would produce likely uh, is the, the key segment for a quality market. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense. Switching to the U S for a minute and then we'll go back uh, to the global stuff, but just how has the, seems like the coal market's not responding in a way that you would have expected it to historically in the face of really high natural gas prices and commodity prices are high across the board. Natural gas isn't the highest it's ever been, but it is setting records and it's certainly the highest we've seen in a long time uh, in my career. It's been the highest it's been. So what is the coal response in the U S how has the U S market uh, been impacted in the recent history? Uh, Cause it seems like there's a disconnect there 
versus what it used to be earlier in my career in the, in the face of high net gas prices. Bring in the US and, um, and that's the other issue for European buyers is that um, even before the war in Ukraine, um, because of the high natural gas prices, um, the, uh, the U S market, uh, was extremely high for coal and the, um, producers were saying that they were contracted out, um, almost fully until 2023, which is very unusual, um, given the, the declines in the U S market over the past years and the struggle that U S coal producers have had. Um, so they were already fully contracted before the war started um, because of the very strong domestic market. And that was a problem for European buyers because they couldn't get the uh, any they, they were having a hard time getting additional exports from the U.S. because of the domestic uh, contracts and and the strong domestic market. And I think as these contracts fall, roll off and that's the end of this year and into 2023, they're going to have the the U.S. utilities are going to be more exposed to the international market, and I think that we're going to end up getting into this bidding war with European buyers. So I would expect to see U.S. coal prices increase significantly on the domestic market as that as those contracts roll off and they have to compete with Europe in order to get coal supplies. So it's not a, and I think, I think in the past, coal markets have been this balancing factor for the gas markets and keeping gas market pricing stable and low, where as coal plants have retired over the years, the market, uh, the U.S. coal market has shrunk by around half for the last decade. The coal market doesn't serve as a balancing factor like it used to. Um, for the gas market um, because there isn't that additional coal supply that could come on. And so it's become, you know, a, less of a, um, a factor for, for gas and gas. And that's why we see gas prices as high as they are, is that, um, you know, there's no relief from other supply sectors so, or other market Absolutely. sectors. Absolutely. Uh, no, that makes sense about the U.S. markets. And we certainly see it in uh, – the nat gas price. And it's been a little bit of a kind of disbelief uh, for me. I'm, I, the thing I tell people when they ask me about gas prices is I'm always like, well, I'm wrong. So whatever I tell you, I'm typically going to be wrong about it because it's really hard to predict these things. But the whole uh, situation with coal, maybe there were some people that could have predicted that would have such an impact on nat gas prices. I, I read a lot of you know daily rag sheets. I didn't see anything about this phenomenon happening prior to when it was kind of starting. And then it was like, Oh, wait a second. We're not getting the, uh, the relief that we're used to was the, were these things in the U S market, something that were on your guys's radar kind of leading up to this. And maybe I should be reading more wood Mac, but, uh, I feel like I was caught off guard by the responsiveness of the coal, uh, coming on to, to relieve Nat gas, uh, demand. Yeah, we did catch on to it. And that's a nice, uh, plug for our products, I would say, is that we've been, um, so we've got uh, a linear programming model where we're able to um, bring in a lot of details from our other um, different commodity markets that we have within Wood Mackenzie. So we have gas power teams um, that we're able to, to feed their information into our models. And one of the things that we were doing is testing um, you know, coal pricing and gas pricing at different price levels. So we would do scenarios every year where we were incrementing gas prices by around 50% up or 50% down from our base case and testing what the threshold was for any kind of gas coal competition. And that's what we were seeing is that the in, it became increasingly inflexible or responsive responsive, um, or, or I should say more responsive on the gas side on, on pricing um, to as as we moved forward in time and more coal plants are retired, um, the uh, the market became more volatile. And so we were we were picking up on, on some of that. It's interesting. Well, well, shifting back over to overseas, you know, you hear about China and what they're doing in terms of on the demand side, you know, there's all these crazy stats like China's building one new coal plant uh, per week or something last year, two years ago. I don't know, whenever that stat was flying around, they're, they're bringing on a lot of new coal, 
coal fired power generation. Uh, how is you talked about India earlier, but China, what's going on over there with uh, their economy kind of getting back going? They had the recent lockdowns this year. Uh, just talk about China kind of broadly, and we'll get into more some to some of the specific topics around it uh, and what's going on in the coal markets there. Yeah, I mean that might be the balancing factor for the coal markets is um, you know sort of demand destruction elsewhere, and that's one of the things that we're seeing in China is that they could uh, we're we're forecasting that they're going to be reducing their seaborne coal import or thermal coal import demand by 64 million tons this year, an enormous amount. They imported around 250 million tons in 2021 um, and are going to be importing around uh, 285 million tons this year. So that's a tremendous amount of coal. They typically import more low quality coal. So again, there's this difference in the high quality and low quality coal market. And so the lot of that uh, tonnage is going to hit Indonesian, Indonesian markets, um, which is a big producer of, of uh, low quality coal or exporter of low quality coal. Um, but that's, that's our view is that um, there's gonna be a tremendous increase in coal demand from Europe, but that's causing demand destruction elsewhere, particularly in China as they reduce um, imported coal demand. Um, India is going to have a more difficult time reducing coal demand. I mean, for China, a lot of it's due to the economic situation there. Um, they've had a lot of COVID lockdowns. Um, the world is kind of teetering on this global economic recession potentially. Um, and that's hit um, the Chinese economy as well as these uh, COVID lockdowns. Um, so their GDP is reducing a lot of their economic activity. And so that's reducing uh, coal generation in general or coal demand in general, um, even on the industrial market. But for India, um, there's still a tremendous need for coal generation, particularly as they had a, a weak hydro year last year, um, which depleted a lot of stockpiles, and they're going to be reliant on, on coal imports. But um, they're taking a lot of uh, imported coal from Russia, so it's... Um, you know, maybe not as as uh, difficult on uh, the seaborne supply from alternatives to Russia because they're they're taking more Im imported Russian coal, so that doesn't yeah. hit that market as bad. We talked about the different producing regions a little bit, but I'm not. You know, we are we've t focused more on demand, who's using what, what are the different types of qualities, but uh, one on one on the different producing region producing regions, who's the who are the big players. Uh, what are the trends? Where is, you know, production rising, falling, et cetera? Because uh, you've kind of talked about it a little bit, but I'd love to hear more. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so for the high quality market, the biggest producers are Australia, um, Colombia, the U.S., South Africa. And so those are the ones that could um, be the alternative suppliers for for Russian coal. Russia, Russia, of course, is also a major supplier of that high quality coal market. Um, for uh, Australia, um, they have, as I was mentioning before, they've had flooding issues, and so there's a risk for them being able to. Early in the year, we were um, suspecting that they might increase production in that market at another five million tons. Um, but that is looking increasingly like, unlikely. They look to be more flat. Um, there was also um, interest in Colombia bringing on um, that Prodeco ba operation back on by before the end of the year and adding some incremental supply. Um, we're looking at Colombia potentially doing um, maybe uh, six, 61, 62 million tons a year, which would have been um, nearly a, a 10 million ton increase over last year. Um, but they've been having flooding issues as well. And so they may only be able to bring on another two or 3 million tons this year. Um, we have them at uh, 57 million tons for the year. Um, the U.S. Uh, looks like a, um, a, 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 I should mention that also um, for South Africa, because they've been having transportation issues, we do see them increasing a little bit this year. Um, but they they haven't been able to 
supply a significant amount of additional tonnage to the market because of those transportation issues with uh, the rail line transnet. For the U.S., we do see them as the potential, the biggest, having the biggest potential to increase um, coal exports this year. Um, and the interesting thing there is that, so there's two different coal markets. There's the thermal coal market and the metallurgical coal market. Uh, metallurgical coal used for steel making, thermal for, for power generation. And the, the situation on the high quality supply market is so tight that we're starting to see metallurgical coal moving into the power market side, which is a very unusual phenomenon, mainly because the metallurgical coal market is, um, uh, it's, a, it's a tighter uh, supply, uh, scarcity of supply in that metallurgical coal market. It's a very particular kind of coal. And they generally, the coal prices in the metallurgical coal market are twice as high as the, the thermal coal market at times. So, it's unusual to see metallurgical coal prices lower than thermal coal pricing, but that's the market that we're in right now. And European uh, buyers are purchasing metallurgical coal tons, and the um, the type in particular that they're looking at is U.S. highball A and B coals, which are uh, probably out of all the different quality of coals and metallurgical coals, those are going to be the ones that are going to be um, the best to use in coal boilers. They're going to have the least amount of issues because a lot of, there's a, there's also issues around slagging and fouling um, in the boilers for using these metallurgical coals just because of the uh, the type of, of quality coal um, uh, that is associated with metallurgical coal. Um, it causes issues in the boilers. And so, but the high ball A and B coals cause the least issues. And so those are the ones that are targeted for the thermal market and, and potentially adding more uh, thermal coal exports availability to Europe. No, that's really great. Um, I didn't, that's a lot of stuff that I didn't know. Hopefully the guests learned some stuff on that as well uh, because it's just, there's a lot of nuances that I'm just not tracking this. And that's really helpful to me. As you think about like future production for coal, Will the financing, like you mentioned this earlier, you touched on it again, but like things like being able to get the financing for it, things like being able to get insurance, like as we get these green pressures on people, uh, will that start to relax as we see prices getting to this level? Or is there going to be a shift, I guess is my point, uh, where people say, you know what, maybe we've come down too hard on coal. This is really impacting not just developing countries, but also uh, first world countries like Europe. Or is the path and the course set and we will continue to see really like a hesitancy and reluctance and even uh, people not wanting to do uh, funding of these new projects or just any views on that? I know that's a little bit of a nebulous question. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the views on coal are starting to soften, particularly in Europe, as they're extremely worried about reliability this winter. And with Russian gas supplies being cut, this last month, and um, and that that really highlights and brings home the need to fortify the coal markets in Europe as a backup to whatever might happen in the gas market um, as we head into winter. So I think, and and there's been talks in Europe about um, you know one they've been willing to bring on all of these mothballed coal units. Um, they've been in talks about easing the, um, the, the carbon pricing um, in order to reduce costs for um, energy. And so there, there is a bit of easing of tensions and, and, um, and uh, more willingness to accept coal um, as a, a reliability strategy. And I think it's, it, and I think it would even accelerate if there is an energy crisis this winter, we could really see um, the uh, the need for reliability and coal for dependency as a, a main issue for for Europe. So I think there is a bit of that, and you know, it it, it might end up being that coal is the transition fuel for Europe going forward, which is not something we would have said before. You know, usually that's gas. Um, because of the um, the lower carbon footprint, but with um, gas markets 
potentially being unreliable or more volatile going forward that might be coal in Europe as the transition fuel. So, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I think that Europe, selfishly for the U.S., we would like for them to be a bigger, a larger buyer of uh, U.S. natural gas that obviously requires a ton of infrastructure uh, that's long dated and that needs to get approved. And it's it's not as easy when you got import terminals and pipelines. I mean, there's just a lot, right? I mean, coal, back to that right. initial comment that I made around, there's a lot of perks to coal. You can store it on site. Uh, it's, you know, it's easier to transport around, uh, you know, you don't have to store it in like underground caverns or big shipping, uh, you know, big ships that have to be pressurized vessels, but what, you know, there was a recent, and Europe uh, already has the infrastructure, right? right? You already have it. Germany didn't for all, you know, what Germany did, uh, with shutting down nuclear plants, they still didn't, I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but they left a lot of their coal stuff kind of sitting there in the wings just in case, right? Like, didn't they kind of keep some of these plants like available? That was sort of like, eh, just on in case. On standby. Like, right. Yeah, right. Just in case. And it's interesting because they're really climbing back down the energy uh, ladder, which is a piece that Doomberg did. And it's like, you know, biomass and uh, which is mostly uh, wood and coal now. And I made like a meme about this earlier, but it's becoming a much bigger piece of the mix uh it's it's just kind of interesting you would think it would be going towards gas like you mentioned but it but doesn't seem to be and a lot of that's kind of self-inflicted and so the last question i'll do here because i've got to run soon and i've told you we keep it to an hour but is uh does is woodmac like tracking kind of the esg and the environmental stuff like looking at you guys have all the production data you have the uh the who's using it data uh so the consumption data so, I mean, like, are you guys looking at emissions globally and these types of things? Are clients of yours interested in this stuff? Is this, to, uh, are you focused on that at all? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We have a energy transitions practice um, that tracks global emissions, policy, um, alternative forms of technology, um, CCS. Uh, we also have emissions benchmarking tools for the production side of any particular commodity. Um, so at the mine site, um, and for example, for coal, the amount of emissions, methane emissions that are um, produced, because that's another op- a topic of um, discussion in the, in the global economies is, is it, it, do you tackle the production side um, when you're, you're tap- tackling um, greenhouse gas emissions? Um, so we do track all of um, these various different types of uh, things happening in the market that's leading to um, this energy transition and um, have products available that would uh, would help any clients that are taking a deep dive into that. Okay. Because you're so familiar with that and this is like a little bit of a cynical question, but like, is, are we making strides? I know it's really easy to look at like, uh, what, you know, the U S does or what Europe's doing or what, you know, Australia does. But when you look at it holistically, how much of the transition talk, in your opinion, just from an emissions reduction standpoint, I'm not talking about like technology or how like batteries are progressing or whatever, but just from in terms of looking at coal, because coal is the big one, right? Um, is it, are we really making, you know, strides forward or has it been a bit exaggerated when you look at the global emissions coming from coal? Because to your point, it's kind of not, hadn't peaked yet. Uh, just your thoughts on coal emissions, where they're at, where they're going. Are we really making the progress that you would think that we would be given the focus we've had on the energy transition? Yeah. I mean, back to the point at the top of the discussion, you know, coal has been increasing, even though it's it's right. it's seen as this commodity that's decreasing. Coal um, demand has been increasing through 2021. Um, as uh, these developing Asian economies um, have growing energy needs and coal is the cheapest form of generation. And so they just have a a huge amount of coal capacity that has come on in recent years and is going to continue to come on. Um, So even though developed economies have been um, working on reducing CO2 emissions and targeting coal plants and retiring coal plants, um, you know, we still see this tremendous amount of coal capacity being added um, and potentially more, you know, CO2 emissions being emitted by um, these growing Asian economies. So, you know, that's been kind of counter to um, the the climate goals of these other um, more developed economies. Right. But, you know, I see 
we're seeing in that in the future, as particularly as that inflection point happens where uh, utility scale solar on a levelized cost basis is going to be the cheapest form of generation in Asia. So then you've got the economic factor that's going to really drive future reductions in, in carbon emissions. So it's it's not policy driven as much as it is the economics of it. Um, and we've seen that in the U.S. market with natural gas. You know, we naturally reduced emissions because of fracking and um, coal basically getting, getting clobbered by natural gas in the in the U.S. Right. market. Um, and that naturally reduced carbon emissions. And so that might be the case for renewables going forward as they become cheaper and cheaper and battery technology gets better and more reliable. Um, you know, the economics of it naturally start to um chip away at co2 emissions so you know that might yeah you know that's uh, you know when we're looking at these uh cases for a 1.5 degree scenario or a two degree scenario um basically what we're seeing is that um with current pledges and the, car- the market as it is with the current go- government pledges we're on track to a two degree scenario at the moment um, one and a half looks less likely, but um, it looks like in the current market, that's where we're on track for. So um, it's interesting. we'll see well, in the future. I'm yeah. sure that there's going to be um, growing pledges and maybe there's even delays in, in countries' ability to actually meet these goals and meet these pledges. So, you know, that could put us above a, a two degree uh, case from what they're looking at um, in yeah. terms of uh, how that relates to CO2 emissions. That's a good way to, that's a great segment to end it on. Uh, but I would say to your, echo your sentiment that I think it has to be bottom up. I think it has to be economics driven. I mean, sure. People will argue with me, look at France, you know, how many nuclear reactors they've built, look at what China, they're building a bunch of things and it's all top down. But ultimately, like if it's not bottom up where the economics support it and like are deflationary for people and make it cheaper energy and it's a better economic case, it's really hard to transition to things. Um, but your insights are, are great on this episode and, uh, and I appreciate you coming on and uh, we will, where's the best place for people if they're interested in uh, Woodmax professional services, or if they're interested in following your commentary, where's the best place to find it? Uh, Woodmax.com. And you can uh, look, look me up. Natalie Biggs and um, contact me on Twitter. I'm happy to to help out and point you in the right direction. And thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks, Natalie.